the story of the San Francisco Giants is legendary. In my years as the official voice of the Giants, I've had the privilege to meet countless players and personalities whose passion for this team is only matched by their love for the game. Their stories are intertwined within the fabric of this team's history. They are Forever Giants. Marvin Bernard's journey to the majors was far from easy. At the age of 12, his family fled war-torn Nicaragua for a better life in the States. As he struggled to adjust to life in a new country, he found solace in the game of baseball. The NAIA All-American, who helped Lewis Clark State College to the national title, was taken in the 50th round of the 1992 draft by the San Francisco Giants. Bernard hits one high. It's a dip. It hits it the eventual Willie Mack Award winner played his entire career with the organization, becoming a leader on a squad that would go on to the 2002 World Series. The long shot from Nicaragua fought tooth and nail to become a major leaguer, etching his name in the hearts of Giants fans in the process. Well, I am joined today by forever giant Marvin Bernard at the beautiful Toomey Cellars here in Calistoga. It is so good to see you. Thank you for taking time to sit down with me. Oh, thank you for having me. I mean, it's, uh, for me, it's, uh, wow, you actually want me to come on your show? Um, yes. Well, here I am. Let's shift gears and go back to growing up in Nicaragua. I mm. want to know about your childhood. Was baseball a part of your childhood life? Did you follow baseball? Were there any players that you admired? Or was it something that was even a possibility in your little young mind? To get to where I got to, no. Uh -huh. It was never a possibility. But I have seen pictures of grandpa in baseball gear, meaning he was a catcher. I have seen pictures of mom in softball gear. And I've, ha I've, I've been around enough parties to hear the bragging that goes on. Uh, you know, everybody trying to say who was the best baseball player, the better baseball player. So it was in the family. There was, was some baseball yes. history in the family. I, I think it's one of those things where, you know how they said, uh, certain situations skips generations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so when I, you know, because of war and everything going on in the country, when you move to the U.S., yeah. my whole baseball thing starts because of a PE class in middle school. Okay. Um, I happened to hit a softball a lot further than everybody else. So how did baseball get into your life? Um, after hitting that ball in softball, <laughs> in, in PE class, the word spread. Oh. You should see how far that kid hit the ball. By the time I got to high school, the head varsity baseball coach said he knew who I was already. You know, um, went to high school, I, I, I tried out, um, made the varsity team as a freshman, didn't play much, and he sent me back down to JV, which was one of the best things to happen to me, because he said, you know, you're not playing here. I want you to go down there, go play. So, okay, was that upsetting to you, or did you understand that you needed- I just wanted to play. Just wanted to play. I didn't care, okay. you know, I didn't care if I was here or here. I knew that when I was up here, I wasn't playing. And if I went down here, I was gonna play. Gotcha. And that's all I cared about. Got it. So I sent, you know, I was like, all right, cool. Got it. Went down, played, and had a great time. I made some amazing friends that I, I still, the group of friends that I made there are the same guys that I hang out with now. That's such a great gift. Yeah. That's such a great gift. So he, he, you know, he did a blessing for me, yeah. you know, yeah. by, by doing that to me. He had a great baseball career, and he had a really good college career too, didn't you? When I got to Lewis and Clark State in Lewis and Idaho, it was a rude awakening for me. Tell me about it. My first day on campus, I, I went to I went to uh, Alaska to play summer baseball. Came back, and my first day on campus, the guy told me he wasted a scholarship on me. <gasps> okay, and your reaction was? Huh? Right. I had no idea what he was doing. Later on, he and I became friends, coach named um, Ed Chef. We became friends and he broke everything down to me, why he did what he did to certain players. And 
I am grateful for what he did for me. The part of the game that he implemented in me was the part that, in my opinion, was the difference between me getting to where I got as opposed to not getting. Mm. It was the mental part of it. Mm -hmm. He was coaching you from that very first moment. And I had no idea. Right. I, I, I didn't realize it. Right. I did not realize it. And like I said, I'm grateful for what he did for me. Yeah. Without realizing what he was doing for me. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. was hard. He was hard. Um, he was preparing me mentally without me realizing for stuff that I was going to go through in the minor leagues. See? And, and I, want, I want you to address that because all, all the players that I talk to, nine times out of ten, they tell me that the mental part of the game may be the toughest part. Yep. You feel that way too? It, it, no one tells you that you're going to have a nine-hour bus ride mm. to wake up the next morning and have to go play a game. Sometimes get there nine hours and jump, you know go to the hotel, drop off your stuff, and get to the ballpark. No one tells you about that. Right. There's no books to read about no that. No one tells no. you that the kid that you're going to be facing has been sleeping for ten hours, and he's coming, uh, which means that he hasn't pitched in four days. Mm -hmm. He's been sleeping, relaxing, resting his whole time. He's full. He's fresh. He's fresh, and he's going to try to come and stuff it down your throat. You know, and no one cares whether you went over four the night before. You know, what are you going to do for me today? Mm -hmm. This is what counts. Mm -hmm. And I saw a lot of guys just complain about this, about that. You know, the, at the hotel that they went to, that there was a dip in their bed. <laughs> you know, no one tells you about that. Right, right. You know, um, so that mindset that he installed in me and a lot of other players was the key for me to get to where I got. He gave you a real gift. Yeah, he said, you know, I'd rather you steal from me than sit here and complain. Because mm -hmm. if you steal from me, I know it's gone. There's nothing I can do about it. But if you're going to sit here and complain the whole time, I got to listen to you. I don't want to listen to you. Right. There's something going on in front of me that I need to take care of. We got to keep it moving. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that part of the game, you know, and, and then you go through the minor leagues and it's similar. You know, long bus ride, bus grind, may break. Just a grind. The, yeah, the yep. bus may break down, you know, but I don't care what you say and do. There's a game going to happen in a couple hours, whether you're on the bus or not, whether you get there or not, you know, something's going to happen. Yeah. So how are you going to handle that? Yeah. And that's the part that made me start looking at things different. And when I got to the minor leagues, I was like, been there, done that. Yeah, it all had clicked in for you. Yep. So it was your college career that caught the attention of the Giants. Is that right? Is... Um, I, I, Come I, would, on. I, I wouldn't say that Come it on. caught the attention of the Giants. I mean, <laughs> I was a 50th round pick. Yeah, I don't but know you were still a pick. Somewhere, somehow, it stuck in my head that I was a guy that was just supposed to be there because someone recommended you and you got drafted. The Giants had no plans for me. None at all. I was a guy that was going to play maybe one year, maybe another year, and then that's it. You so know? you felt maybe less pressure or felt you had something to prove? Um, something to prove. Mm -hmm. So then I go from 92, where I didn't play much, to 93 in Clinton, Iowa, and another one of those steps in the uh, in that ladder mm -hmm. was a guy named a minor league coach named Jack Mo. Okay. Jack Mo came up to me in spring training and told me that I would be on the team no matter what unless he got fired or died that I'll be on the team. And he stuck with me. I mean there's times I couldn't hit water if I fell out of a boat. I couldn't do anything right. But he had your back. But he had my back. Yeah. Um when the season's over I, I went up to him and said, I just want to say thank you. I said, that, you know, there's times I had no confidence in myself uh, and you stuck with me. And he looked at me and smiled and he said, you made me look like an effing genius. <laughs> you know, because when the season's over, I had a great season. Uh huh. Um, and that was, a, that, was, that was the first time my eyes opened up to make me think that I could get to the big leagues. Yeah. You know, that was 93. Um, I was in Clinton, Iowa, 
and spring training of 94, I get invited to instructional league. And you get there and, you know, it's last year's first rounder, there's at least four first rounders, four second round pick, uh, and then there's me, 50th round pick. And that's when I come in to the next step in that ladder, which is Dusty. Okay, let's, you brought him up, let's go. <laughs> let's talk about Dusty, the impact he had on you, and playing for Dusty. Yeah. And you, we, you also shared with me about Dusty's clubhouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, talk about okay. the man, the myth, the legend okay. that is Dusty Baker. In spring training of 94, you know, Dusty's getting introduced to everybody. And so when I meet him, I tell him that my initials are MLB, Marvin Larry Bernard, you know, Major League Baseball. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't know when, where, or how, but I'm going to play in the big leagues. <laughs> and he looked at me. And I could remember, I, I'm running these words. He goes, all right, little man, we'll see what you can do. <laughs> and he said, just like that, that. yeah. yeah. He, you know, and I'm like, all right, man, you know. So we go ahead and we start doing our thing. And I didn't realize that he told me this later, that he was watching me take bat in practice and he could hear the ball jumps off my bat. Oh, wow. The ball makes a different sound. Yeah when he comes off certain guys' bat. I had no idea. Again, I was just doing my thing. Um, and he, he kept calling me up to big league games in spring training. He would call me up and call me up. And I, and I would go, and some, there were days where I wouldn't even get to play, but I was there for four hours. You know, go back to my leagues, no big deal. Call me up again. I, I think I went like a week straight, he would call me up. Mm. And in that whole week, I think I got maybe two at-bats. and. I would get a chance to go hit and I'll hit a ball on the nose as hard as I could and someone would catch it. And I'll come back and sit down and just, and he, I remember he looked at me one time and he came and he goes, hey man, he goes, uh, that doesn't bother you? I said, what do you mean? He goes, for, some, for you to hit a ball that hard and someone to catch it? I said, I mean, I did my job. I was supposed to hit it as hard as I could, right? He goes, yeah. And he goes, all right, little man. And he walked away. And I did it again. And I didn't understand what he meant by that. Later on, I, you know, I started seeing guys would get upset, throw stuff, you know, smash their bats. And I did my job. There's only, that's the only thing I could control. Once I hit it, I have no control over it. He appreciated your approach to yeah. the game. Yeah. And that nothing phased you. You just kept coming back, trying to do your best. Trying to do the best and that's I could. all he wanted to see. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Went to double A, had a good year. Went to 95, went to um, triple A. Remember at the All-Star break, um, the, giant, the, the big league team played an exhibition game against a triple A team. And I had found out that my wife was pregnant. And I went to him, I said, hey, um, I need to pay some bills. <laughs> I told him just like that, I said, I need to pay some bills. My wife is pregnant. I need to find a way to get to the big leagues. What do I need to do? Oh. And he said, get, you know, he goes, you hit 300 and we'll see what we can do. And I was like, okay. You know, I wasn't playing every day and I was hitting like 260 something, went back. And there was a bunch of changes that they made in the organization with the managers and everything. Next thing you know, I'm playing every day. When the season's over, I'm hitting 300. And Jim, Jim Davenport called me in the office and said, hey, uh, you're going to the big leagues tomorrow. You had a, a very magical inaugural season in 2000. There was one moment in particular that I need you to talk about. I think you know where I'm going with this. It was Sunday night baseball. Yep. Against the team, that team we've been mentioning that wears blue down in Southern California, which, by the way, he <laughs> rooted for when he was growing up in Los Angeles. I respect that. I had no choice. I respect that. All right, okay, okay. So tell me what happens. I come out leading off the 10th inning, and we were, I can't remember the score. We were tied, obviously. Yeah. And Mike Fetters was pitching. Mm hmm. I. I I think it was a 2-2 pitch. He tried to run a fastball in on me, and he got stuck over the middle of the plate. Boom. 
and I put the head of the bat on it and the ball just took off and went over and it was my first ever walk off. Hitting that home run was like, it, it was, on a personal level, it was, you know, mind boggling. And then to realize later on, and, and you know, you don't keep track of things, but you know, Dusty said that that was a moment that we took off. After that, we took off. That's right. And it just, it's like it brought a different energy to That's the team. Right. And it, it, we took off and ended up, we ended up in the playoffs in because the, of play. it. That's why it was, it was a magical season. And yeah. it really did. It, it, you catapulted it. Yeah, yeah. You really did. Yeah. Well, we talked earlier, before the camera started rolling, about Sean Dunstan and what he meant to you. He uh, was your big brother. Yes, yes. Sean, Tell me about that relationship. Sean, for me, um, is my introduction to Major League Baseball. We were in... Uh, Spring training, I can't remember the year, but we went to a restaurant and Sean and I were sitting there and I looked up and there was three minor league players for the Giants. And Sean might want to kill me for this, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna let people know that. You know, it's okay, people it's need okay. to know this story, yeah. it's great. So there were, there were three kids sitting there and I said, oh wow, look, I said, Peanut, check it out. I said, there's three minor league players for the Giants there. You're P.F. Chains. P.F. Chains, yeah. yeah. And I said, they're splurging. He said, what do you mean? I said, man, this restaurant's expensive for them to be sitting here. And I said, you forgot what it's like to be in the minor leagues. You don't get much meal money down there. And I said, watch, when they bring their food, they're gonna get a dish of peace and they're all gonna pass it around. You knew how it was gonna go I, down. I, <laughs> You've I've been, been there. there. <laughs> exactly, I've been there. So they brought their food and sure enough, they started sharing stuff and then he went, wow. I said, Peanut, you forgot what it's like to be down there. So anyways, when the waiter came by, Sean asked him to give him the check. So he brought it and you know, he paid for the check and then we got up and he went and he opened his man purse or like i like the teasing, merce. The merce, there you go <laughs> like teasing him about that and he gave him each a hundred dollars and he told him if you say anything <laughs> i'm gonna punch you in the mouth mm -hmm. right the reason i say that is because everywhere i went with sean and i would run into an ex-teammate of his veteran guy they would always say the same thing make sure he pays <laughs> right because he for whatever reason they said he was cheap but sean was never cheap mm -mm. sean just looked at you depending on where your pay scale was. <laughs> and if your pay scale was where his was or above, we're gonna split this. If you're below, I'll take care of it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and that, that, you know, that's, that's Sean. Right. So I asked him one time, I said, Peanut, what's the deal? Why? He said, well, when I was a rookie in the big leagues, Lee Smith took care of me. He put a down payment on my apartment. And I, you know, to think about someone to put a down payment on your apartment, it's mind boggling. Yeah. Um, you know, but l when he tried to pay Lee Smith, when he started making money, tried to pay him back, Lee Smith said, don't pay me back, pass it along. You know, so. And that's what he's done. Exactly. So when, once you get to where you were, you try to do the best you can to let it trickle down. Yeah. So talk to me about the transition from being a player to the broadcast booth. Was that challenging for you or did it come, kind of come naturally for you? I don't shut up. I'm always yapping away. So I thought it was going to be easy just go and yap oh. away until I got in the booth and I started realizing that the way you yap around with your friends and your buddies is not the same way you're going to yap around on the radio. Okay. So at <laughs> first I was a little bit tongue tied and I started realizing that the more I did it, and Erwin told me this early, he goes, you'll get your, you, you find your style and you find your tone and you find how do your, how your flow goes. Mm -hmm. um, He's a good coach, right? Yes, it made it easy. Yeah. It, you know, which I want to back up and say something and, you know, you never know who you're going to run into, when you're going to run into in the front and in the back. And what I refer to that is, I met Erwin at uh, Candlestick. And then we came over to the new ballpark, right, at mm -hmm. AT&T. And I, I had a great relationship with him. He would come down, he would ask, and I, I was always there for him. You know, whatever he asked, I tried to help. Well, when Tito decided that he can't travel anymore because of his knees, they had to find someone to replace and do those road games. 
and my name popped up. So if I would have been a jerk to Irwin, my name would have never came into the whole thing. That's so true. Yeah, and, and that's one of my things. I, I always think about who am I meeting, where am I meeting them, and how to treat that person, you know, apart from, you know, what could come out of it. You know, you just treat people like the human beings because ultimately you want to get treated that way too. Absolutely. But anyways, coming back to the whole thing, Irwin um, called me up and said, hey, would you be interested in doing some road, you know, road game, Tito can't travel anymore. And I was like, uh, sure, why not? Did you, were you immediately all in or did you have any hesitation or? I was all in with hesitation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, you got people who drive in the street with two foot, right? One's on the gas, one's on the brake. Okay. That was me, that was me. <laughs> um, and as time's gone by, this is my third year. Uh, it's, been all, it's been amazing. Um, and there's been more, I've been getting more and more involved. Where, where I get caught up is when I start thinking about a particular, particular players that are players that are similar to myself. And you go up there and you're sitting there going, how come he's not doing this? How come he's not doing that? His job is to do this because this is his description of a, of a job. Mm. But the computer says, it's okay, take that away and do this. I could understand why but at the same time, I, I could contradict against it. Yeah. You know, so, you know, just got to sit there and go, okay. Yeah. They know what they're doing. That's why they get paid the big bucks. Right. My job is just to <laughs> talk about it. Right, right. Yeah. Well, so. just stay out of your head, get out of your own way, have fun. Yes. You and that's, know? that's the key to the whole thing. That's the key to the whole thing. That's the key to the whole thing. As an, as an OG broadcaster, if I may share that there with you. you. Yeah. There you go. No. Well, congratulations. And it's, it's just so great to see you around the ballpark from time to time. And I get to see you on the road from time to time as well. But we have to wrap now because we're going to enjoy some more wine is what we're going to do. I can't thank you enough. This has been a wonderful conversation. My, do my boy, my dude since 2000, number seven, Marvin Vinod. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, babe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Cheers. Uh -huh.